Earlier this week, I was fortunate enough to be able to narrate a crime story on the amazing channel Forgotten Lives. I've left a link to the story below, just in case any of you would like to check it out after this video. Today, we are looking at a case from the mid 20th century. So sit back as we go to Jamaica. Leslie George Hilton was born in Jamaica on the 29th of March, 1905. He lived with his mother in one of the poorer areas of the country's capital, Kingston. He had a difficult childhood as he never knew his father and when he was just three years old, his mother died. Following this, Leslie went to live with his aunt. She did her best to bring up her nephew. However, tragedy struck again as when Leslie was in his early teens, his aunt died. So instead of finishing his education, he left school and took up an apprenticeship at a tailor's shop. Like many teenagers in early 20th century Jamaica, Leslie liked to play cricket. At every opportunity he would meet his friends to play. He seemed so at home on the cricket field and it soon became apparent that he had a remarkable aptitude for the sport. In order to earn more money, he left his apprenticeship and went to work as a labourer at Kingston Docks. He was tall, strong and athletic and proved to be a very good employee. As well as working hard, he continued to play cricket. Cricket had been introduced to Jamaica by the British in the 19th century and Kingston Cricket Club was founded in 1863. The local people embraced the sport and many became very talented players. By the 1920s, even the more exclusive cricket clubs on the island had realised how good the local young men were at playing and started to invite them to represent their teams. One of the talented young men was Leslie Hilton. He had developed his skills as both a bowler and a batsman. It was rare to find a player who possessed skills with both bat and ball, as a majority of players would specialise as either a batsman or a bowler. But Leslie was extremely good at both. Soon his talents were recognised at a national level and in 1927 he was selected to play for Jamaica. He went on to represent his country on 40 occasions. Later, he was given the opportunity to play for the West Indies cricket team, making his debut on the 8th of January 1935 in a test match against England at the Kensington Oval in Bridgetown, Barbados. He was now playing cricket at the highest possible level and playing with and against some of the finest players in the world. He was selected again in 1939 in a three test tour of England. This series of matches was completed on Tuesday the 22nd of August and with the rising tensions in Europe, the West Indian team returned home before Britain entered World War II on the 3rd of September 1939. During the war years, test match cricket was suspended and although there was some domestic cricket played in Jamaica during this period, Leslie was approaching 35 years of age and retired from playing the sport at the top level. He was now a well-known and well-respected person in his country. So despite his lack of education, he was offered a position in the employment of the Jamaican Rehabilitation Service. In 1940, Leslie met a young lady named Laleen Rose. She was the daughter of a Jamaican police inspector named Philip Rose. However, despite Leslie's success as a cricket player, he had come from a poor background and Aline's parents did not approve of him courting their daughter. Despite her parents' reservations, Leslie and Laleene married in October 1942 and in 1947, she gave birth to the couple's son, who they named Gary. The marriage seemed a happy one Leslie continued to work for the rehabilitation service while his wife looked after their son. By 1950, Jamaica was changing. The economy had experienced a post-war boom, which continued as the country became less dependent on agriculture and industries such as mining grew significantly. This led to increased opportunities for the workforce and the ability to learn new skills for the changing times. Laleen had always harboured ambitions to be a fashion designer. Her husband had travelled while playing cricket and she thought that if she studied hard, she could learn the skills needed to design clothes and even start her own fashion brand. The only problem was 
then in order to achieve this, she would have to spend extensive periods away from her husband and young son, as she would have to go to New York, where she could study the art of French couture. It was agreed that Leslie and the couple's young son would move into Laline's mother's home so she could assist with the childcare. Her father had died a few years earlier. In April 1951, Laline commenced her studies in New York. The couple now started to spend much time apart. Leslie's life didn't change much. He would go to work, take care of his son, and watch cricket whenever he could. He still had a keen interest in the performances of both the Jamaican and the West Indies cricket team. Laline's life in New York, however, was totally different to anything she had experienced back home. She had moved from Kingston, which was a small and friendly place, to a very large and busy city, which had global prominence. In 1952, New York had a population of over 7.8 million and was a centre for world business and finance. With its bars and clubs, life in the cosmopolitan city must have been very exciting for anyone who moved there. In mid-April 1954, Leslie received a letter. It had been sent anonymously and suggested that while he had been working and bringing up his son, his wife had been seeing another man in New York. Distressed and confused, Leslie considered exactly what he should do. Was the letter true? He decided to send a telegram to Laleen, telling her to come home immediately. Later he received a reply, which read, Don't worry, all will be well. Love from your wife. Laleen then arranged her return, arriving in Jamaica on the 2nd of May. When Leslie questioned her, she denied that she was seeing another man, and dismissed the accusations in the letter as rumour and speculation. Although Leslie was not entirely convinced, he seemed to accept her explanation. However, three days later on the 5th of May 1954, he saw the young boy who worked in the garden take a letter given to him by Laleen to the post office. Leslie was still suspicious, so went to the post office and asked if he could retrieve the letter. His request was denied. By this time, Leslie was not in a good emotional state. His wife had denied having an affair, yet the anonymous letter informed him that she was, and now he had discovered that she was secretly sending letters to New York. He decided to again confront his wife. In the early hours of the 6th of May 1954, the couple had a heated argument, when suddenly, Laleen's mother and neighbours heard the sound of gunfire. Her mother, named Constantia, knew that there was a gun in the house, as her son, Manly Rose, had given it to Leslie, following her husband Philip's death a few years earlier. She got out of bed, and as she walked towards the couple's bedroom, she saw Leslie. He looked at her blankly and said that he had just shot his wife and that she was dead. Leslie then called the police, who soon arrived at the house and inspected the scene. They detained him while he spoke of the crime. Strangely, they did not arrest or caution him, despite him trying to explain what had happened. His words, however, made no sense. He was highly emotional and seemed confused. Eventually, he was taken to the police station and charged with the murder of his wife. The story was extensively reported in the Jamaican press and the public seemed sympathetic towards Leslie. He had worked his way up from a working-class neighbourhood in Kingston, never knowing his father. His mother had died when he was just three years old, and this was followed ten years later by the death of his aunt, who had been his guardian. But despite such a hard start to his life, he had risen to play cricket at the highest level. It didn't seem possible that he now had to stand trial for the murder of his wife. The trial started in October 1954 and Leslie was defended by two very well-respected lawyers named Vivian Blake and Noel Nethersoul. Leslie knew Noel well as he was the captain of the Jamaican cricket team in the 1930s and they had represented Jamaica together on many occasions. His counsel was also sympathetic to him as knowing that he was not a man of wealth, they agreed to waive their fees. The fact that the deceased had been shot by her husband was not in any doubt. The prosecution had to prove that the shooting of Laleen 
had been a premeditated act. The defence told the court that the defendant acted in self-defence and explained that after he had received the letter informing him that his wife was having an affair, he became very emotional. He had been apart from his wife for a considerable time, working hard and bringing up their child. He asked her to immediately return home and when she did, he confronted her about the accusations. She, however, denied them. When the defendant discovered that his wife had sent a letter to the man who he had been told she was seeing, he again became suspicious and wondered if the sender of the anonymous letter he had received had in fact written a true account of what his wife had been doing in New York. Then the postmistress would not show him the letter written by his wife. So he returned to his mother-in-law's house and again questioned his wife about the allegations. But this time, he told her that the postmistress had actually allowed him to read the letter. The defence said that Laleen then admitted that she was in a relationship in New York with another man who she loved dearly and that she wished that she had followed her parents' advice and never married Leslie. The defence claimed that she had said, I have found the man I love. You cannot stand in my way. She then fetched the gun that was in the bedroom and tried to shoot the defendant, but the gun misfired. Leslie tried to wrestle it from her, and in the struggle, Laleen was shot. The defence also showed the court a letter that Laleen had written to her lover, which explicitly described her love for him and the lack of any feelings towards her husband. The letter and the testimony from Laleen's mother suggested that she may have taunted her husband and the defence claimed that when she admitted her infidelity, it sent him into a temporary state of emotional insanity. The prosecution, however, produced some credible witnesses. The pathologist stated that the deceased had received several gunshot wounds and that the preciseness of them didn't suggest that they were the result of a gun being fired during a struggle. Forensic analysis also proved that eight bullets had been fired, which meant that at some point, the gun was reloaded. When the prosecution questioned Laleen's mother, she told the court that the gunshots were not all in quick succession, rather over a period of a few minutes. The testimony, along with that of the pathologist and neighbours who heard the shots, all helped the prosecution build the case that the death of Laleen Hilton was not due to a jealous rage, but the result of a planned and calculated act. They informed the court that the defendant had purchased new cartridges the day before his wife returned from New York. When asked why he did this, Leslie said that there had been some robberies in the area and he wanted to make sure that he would be able to defend himself and his family in the event of anyone trying to enter their property. But when asked why he had reloaded the gun, he said that he had intended to take his own life. He tried to do this twice, but the gun misfired. The trial ended on the 20th of October 1954, and after the judge summed up the case, the jury was sent out to deliberate. They returned an hour and a half later, but were unable to reach a unanimous verdict. The judge asked them to go back and discuss the case some more. When they returned, they sat in the packed but very silent courtroom, and the judge asked the jury foreman if they found the defendant guilty or not guilty. The foreman replied, guilty, but added that they recommended mercy. The judge, however, was unmoved and sentenced the defendant, Leslie George Hilton, to death. His defense team appealed the sentence, but at each attempt, the appeal was dismissed. And on the 17th of May, 1955, Leslie George Hilton, was hanged at St. Catherine's District Prison. His execution coincided with the fourth test match between the West Indies and Australia at the Kensington Oval in Barbados. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. And again, I'd like to thank Forgotten Lives for letting me narrate a case on his channel last week. As I said before, there is a link below. As usual, Please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.